lost in the dryer or something? Oh, good evening and welcome to Having a Drink with Mink. I'm your host, Jason Mink, and uh, I was just explaining to Larry that I seem to have lost my top button in the dryer. I'm sorry for the more sensitive uh, among you out there in the audience. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to go all buck wild or anything, but uh, I think we can handle it. It's been a hot summer. After all, I hope things are cooling down where you are, and I hope that you have a nice beverage on hand, because, as you can see, we've got a lot to get to. So, let's make it happen. Right off the bat, we're going to take a look at something that, uh, well, we've looked at twice before. But, uh, well, sometimes these episodes, they just don't work out. This is for those who have never seen it, and for those who have never forgotten it. It is, of course, Midnight Cowboy with Dustin John and Hoffman Voigt. Oh, yeah. Their immortal performances will live on. Razzo Rizzo and Joe Buck. You know it. This is an absolutely classic flick. If you've never seen it, highly recommend it. Uh, even if you're not as interested in the story, it's a wonderful way of experiencing uh, an aspect of New York City that is long gone. If you were to go there today, well, you certainly wouldn't experience it as these two had. And uh, if you're an old comics aficionado, well, there are a few moments in there for you as well. And uh, Joe Bach, well, what can I say? I may have modeled my entire life on him when it comes right down to it. I'm a hustler, ma'am! <laughs> All right, not really. But uh, classic flick, absolutely. Now, I picked this poster up. This is from the 1980 reissue of the film. But uh, nonetheless, very striking. Look great up on the studio wall. If you guys would like a studio tour at some point in time, well, let me know. It's been a while since we've done the last one, and that last one was uh, pretty greasy, I have to say. Absolutely. Speaking of greasy, it's the Trailer Park Boys. Now, I've been with the boys since early days. I watched the first seasons on Roku, caught all of the movies, and hung in there through the Netflix years. Now Sunnyvale's most odious offenders have their own comic book, and it's about damn time. The comic is an anthology made up of four short stories penned in a variety of styles. From hyper-stylized to the more animated aesthetic, the book makes great use of the illustrated format to stretch out into areas that show might not otherwise be able to reach, while the writing stays true to the characterization and tone of what we've seen up till now. The over-the-top profanity and explicit drug and alcohol use aren't for everybody, which is fine. The market is more than capable of bearing more adult content, and if publisher Devil's Do keeps it up, well, I'll be buying at least one new comic book again. On a scale of greasy to decent, this one is chicken fingers. The good kind. All right. Here we have a little bit of plastic action. We're going to get right into that. It's Ultraman. Now, the 1990s, we saw a boom of crazy products. Uh, if you would go into your KB, you would go into your local uh, Children's Palace or Toys R Us, you would see toys from lines uh, that had cartoons, shows that you didn't even know about. This was back before, you know, the Internet was really a thing, back before you could jump on Netflix and see all that stuff. It all depended on what channel was carrying what show. And you very well may have missed the latest iteration of Ultraman. Now, this may have been an animated thing. I have to admit, I didn't really do my research ahead of time. I was busy looking for my button. But uh, this guy is Majaba. Oh, yeah, and he's some kind of creepy bug dude. You know it, Ultraman. That's the sort of thing that he would have fought. Absolutely, this is the Alien series, and he's an intruder. $9.99. What a deal, huh? You know it, folks. And uh, who do we get in the assortment? We have Barangas. This guy is sort of a, what is he, a Skeletor's Battle Cat kind of feel. A Panthor. Here's Kalaze. I like his turtleneck. Very sharp, very stylish. He's Bowgun. 
looks like something that you may have inadvertently sneezed on your computer monitor. And uh, there's the Ultraman figure. Not a lot of articulation, as far as it goes. This would have been kind of a disappointment, but it would have had to have had him nonetheless. And here he is, out of the box. Looking good, and all his locusty glory. That's what he kind of is, right? Sort of greenish locust kind of lobster look at thing he's got the big old claw there you know the chitinous uh, body armor two hickeys here you got the tentacles you gotta have tentacles you know what i mean you uh, have the antenna for communicating with the mothership big old bulbous eyes like i said back in the day i made it a point to pick this guy up because uh, i felt that he was uh, just an awesome monster as far as it goes, I didn't have any of the other characters, but I figure, you know, he would look good menacing old Star Wars figures, G.I. Joe figures, you know, I'd hassle my girlfriend with them. Oh, she loved that. I wonder where she is now. <laughs> but uh, when I picked him up the other day, I realized that he'd make a wonderful compliment to the recent Mego Ultraman, and uh, Mego Ultraman has been looking with great trepidation at this figure this entire time, so I'm going to have him battling it out on the shelf. So, all right, let's hear it for toys, huh? They're a small thing, but they bring us a lot of joy. Absolutely. I don't know if you've seen the uh, latest preview for the uh, Ultraman film that's going to be coming out. Um, doesn't look as good as that 2017 proof of concept video that's up. Um, I was hoping that it would be a little more like that. It seems to be more like a Marvel movie, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, maybe the final product will be something between those two things. We'll just have to see. Shin Ultraman is on its way out. So keep your eyes open for that and keep your beta capsule handy. Okay, as you can see, we got a big old pile of comics to get to. And what's in the pile? Well, right off the bat, these fascinating Detroit News supplements. The Spirit Daily comic strip first began appearing in American newspapers on October 13, 1941, and ran until March 4th of 1944. The strip saw work from no less than Will Eisner, Jack Cole, and Lou Fine. I picked up a stack of these at my local comic shop because, well, let's face it, they're just not something you see every day. They're marked Limited Collector's Edition and bear a copyright of 1972 in the name of Will Eisner. These eight-page black-and-white reprints also feature individual commentary on the back page for mostly every issue by the artist. They measure six and a half by nine and three-eighth inches and feature decent quality copy reproductions for the time and price point. Another curiosity to bolster the archives. Just fascinating stuff, absolutely, for sure. And uh, well off the beaten path, but the kind of thing that, you know, if you love old comics, you won't be able to look away from. No, sir. All right, speaking of a love of old comics, even back in the 1960s, you had fellas and gals who were just over the moon about these characters and their adventures, and uh, perhaps nowhere is that better illustrated, at least in fan corridors, than the Illustrated Comic Book Collector's Handbook. As you can see, this is a uh, very much a fan-made publication with its uh, crudely cut-out images on the cover. It's Xerox-level reproduction. Actually, maybe more of a mimeograph. It uh, looks a little sharper. Blacker blacks. But uh, this basically is a collection of uh, character biographies, you know, talking about uh, all your favorites. The Black Lion and Cubby. Can't miss it. And uh, <laughs> a little bit of artistic embellishment. I remember the scribble. Only appeared once, but, uh, you know, we're hoping they bring him back in a future movie. And then, very much in the spirit of improvement, here's the Illustrated Comic Collector's Handbook, Volume 2. As you can see, we now have a very striking cover featuring Captain Commando. Sneaking up on this no-gooder, 
seems to have some sort of uh, missile aimed at, uh, you know, the good guys. But uh, the captain, well, he's there to make sure that's not going to happen. And then on the back, why, the Incredible Hulk? Take your pick, really. Comes right down to it. Really like the printing on this one. I'll admit that uh, Zipatoni kind of pattern. Very, very striking. And uh, Hulk clearly hasn't missed leg day. Man, he's doing some hot yoga if he can take on that pose. And uh, on the interiors, we have basically more of the same from the first book. More character biographies. You know, uh, many of these look like they may have been, uh, you know, directly traced from the old comics. But nonetheless, you get characters like Flexo. And uh, count me in as far as the Flexo fan club. Then you got Mini Midget and uh, Riddy. You know it. Airman, Crash Kid. And <laughs> everyone's favorite, Speed Centaur. You're not going to want to miss this. It's the Illustrated Comic Collector's Handbook from the SFCA. No, I'm not sure what that means, but uh, you send them a couple bucks in the mail. I'm sure they'll work it out. And then, put your 3D glasses on now, because we're going down the road of 3D Dons Macabre. It's the 3D Zone. The 1980s saw an abundance of these 3D titles. It's in Zone Vision. Oh, you know it, baby. And then... <laughs> I passed this book by a number of times recently, and the specter hangs over my shoulder, much like his nose would if he were standing right there, the smell of recently consumed cat on his breath. This is ALF, the first issue from Marvel Comics. I just had to have it. I mean, what can you say? He was a cultural icon, both then and now. And then... Here's a book that uh, I remember enjoying quite a bit back in the day. This is Mightfall. It's a Legends of the Dark Might special, written by Alan Grant with artwork by Kevin O'Neill of Martial Law fame. Always been a huge Martial Law fan, one of my all-time favorite comic books. And uh, to be able to see Kevin Stratus stuff in a DC book, pretty excellent. You know, especially uh, good at over-the-top sort of stuff like this 1990s-style Azrael. There he is, the Dark Might himself. This book is a joy if you can find it in the dollar bin or even for a couple bucks, along with the other back issues. Well worth it if you're a Batman fan or you just enjoy fun comics in general. And then, speaking of fun comics in general, Ace Comics presents Daredevil Battles the Claw. These are Lev Gleason reprints from 1987, featuring the original Daredevil vs. the Claw stories from Silver Street Comics, number 7 and 8, now in glorious black and white, illustrated by the legendary Jack Cole. And then here's a book that we skipped over in the last one, but I uh, wanted to make sure that I showed you. This is the Bone Crushing Adventures of Delta 10 in Burger Heaven. Oh, yeah, Shades of the Joker movie. You know it. This is almost like a barbed wire meets the Joker, and uh, who wouldn't be standing in line for that? You know, these black and white comics from the 1980s, there were so many of them, you couldn't possibly keep track. You know, a lot of them were critically acclaimed, but maybe you never even saw them. But this is quite striking. Paul Holly presents Delta 10. So it looks like uh, we're already on issue 6, so... Must have been pretty good, right? Speaking of black and white comics, this is one from the 90s. This is Dork, number two. And I made it a point to pick this up because it's got milk and cheese. My good pal Owen Halter line, he was over the moon about milk and cheese. He had all their appearances. He had the t-shirts. If there had been action figures, well, he would have had those as well. But uh, not only that, you get all sorts of wonderful Evan Dork and Madness in here. There on the back. Hey, everybody. Are you ready to alternative rock? 
I know I wasn't. And then uh, here's some eight ball. Oh yeah, now I have a copy of this. I must admit, but kind of beaten up. And uh, any time I can pick up a decent upgrade, I make it a point. Next up, here's a book that I felt that I had to have, even though it's seen better days. Absolutely, got some uh, serious water damage along the top here. I think this came out of someone's pacer. You know, maybe the back window had been broken, sitting on a pile of moldy rags for a long time. Nonetheless, uh, it's Elson's Presents Series 2 of DC Superhero Comics. That's 96 action pages in full color, mostly pink apparently, but uh, this is a fascinating artifact because it comes to us from the good folks at Elson's. Now, I'm not sure if that's what this guy's name is, but apparently he's the superhero sidekick of a series of newsstands that were prominent in airports and uh, other transportation hubs back in the late 1970s. And here he is uh, flying around, and apparently he needs a candy bar to recharge. So he's stopping on by, and, uh, well, he can also get cigars, razors, a local news paper, all that good stuff. So you're going to want to make it a point to stop on by, pick one of these bad boys up. Now there's no price on it, so I assume that they were blowing them out for a great deal. And uh, that's kind of unsurprising because they're most likely remaindered comics with the covers taken off. The books that appear here are Superman 355, Ghosts number 96, and Justice League of America number 186, all dated January of 1981. An odd assortment, to be sure. So yeah, absolutely, it's a fun artifact. You gotta wonder whatever happened to Elson Man here. You know, if he's still fighting the good fight, or, you know, if he gave it up a long time ago. Then here's an issue of Showcase Presents the new Doom Patrol. And uh, I gotta say, don't really know a lot about the new Doom Patrol, but there's something about these covers that always catches my attention. <laughs> I don't think that I've read one of them yet, but uh, who knows, maybe when I have the whole run. And uh, long afternoon off. And then here's some Firestorm. And this is a crossover with uh, Legends. Y'all remember that? When everything changed again. This is uh, when Pittsburgh burns. Ronnie and the Professor vowed to destroy Firestorm. Now, as a Pittsburgh resident, well, I'm always alarmed when I see things like this. Please don't go burning down my city or turning it into a toxic pit. You know, I get it. Uh, we're not New York, but nonetheless, cut us a break. But uh, making it a point to collect a... Uh, Pittsburgh Catastrophe Comics, and uh, perhaps we'll focus on uh, that topic in the future comics for breakfast. Here we have the evil Spider-Man attacks in Monster Menace number four. And these are pre-Silver Age reprints of those crazy comics that Marvel was all about back in the day. Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, they would crank them out month after month. Presentation is dynamite in these 90s books. Nice, bright white paper. Lovely colors. Can't go wrong, especially when you find them in a dollar bin. I dared to battle Rorg, the king of the Spider-Men. I did all right. I only lost a button. And then, do you dare enter the world of Night World? This is a fascinating book that I didn't know anything about, but apparently uh, it was uh, quite a thing back in the day. They actually did a little bit of crowdfunding for this. And uh, they put it to Image, and uh, Image did a little bit of legwork, and they made this uh, series happen. It is a four-issue limited series. I just have number one, but I gotta say... This is dynamite, absolutely very much in the spirit of those classic comics you love so much. Has a very Jack Kirby vibe, but at the same time, contemporary intensity, some lovely coloration. So I'll be making it a point to pick up more of these. Yes, I know, they're not technically old comics, but, uh, you know, you gotta support that stuff that uh, keeps the spirit of the old comics going. Then here's the saga of Ra's al Ghul. 
This is from a series of reprints published by DC in the uh, 1980s. And uh, I felt this was a good way to get those books because otherwise, you know, they might be out of my hands. And uh, the printing in these is nice, very eye-catching, certainly an upgrade on the uh, original print copies, I'm guessing. That looks pretty good. And then... Here's some more of those Marvel reprints. Save me from the curse of the weird, the return of the brain, the menace of the hog, until death do us part. Do you dare enter where monsters dwell? Well, yeah. Yeah, I do. And uh, it's well worth it because, well, what do we get? We get some Basil Wolverton. You know, what can you say? Any comic where you get some Basil Wolverton is an absolute win, but there's so much more than that. Here's some Vic Carosa artwork in Till Death Do Us Part, which looks like quite the little romantic pot boiler. <laughs> Here's The Hog, featuring, you know, some folks with some bad uh, highway manners. All sorts of great stuff in here capped off by the return of the brain so yeah you can still find these books in the dollar bin and uh, if you do well they're well worth picking up even if you have them yourself and really nice hardbacks well they make great gifts they make great trade bait or you could just give them out at halloween i mean it is coming up in a few weeks Speaking of Halloween, this is a spooky book about the Beatles' experience featuring Paul McCartney's Dead or Alive? For those of you unfamiliar with the story, the legend goes that in 1966, famed Beatles singer and bass player Paul McCartney was killed in an early morning auto accident. This was allegedly hushed up by the band's management, with the dead beetle being replaced by nothing less than a look-alike who was passed off as the genuine article. The legend was bolstered by news reports and the finding of supposed clues on Beatles albums revealing the truth to the world. And while today it's clear the whole thing was a fabrication, there remains a small and noisy minority who push stuff like this in spite of its absurdity. Then again, it was a fake mustache. So, there it is, folks. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Having a Drink with Make. I hope to see you next time. From all of us to all of you, cheers. <laughs>